Welcome to the More to the Story podcast. I am so glad that you all have come along. This is my last episode before the Global Methodist Churches Gen General Conference, the convening General Conference, which is going to happen in San Jose, Costa Rica. And I'm headed there tomorrow morning. I leave at 5 a.m. with some of my friends from our delegation here in Mississippi, West Tennessee. So I wanted to just check in with you on a couple of things. First of all, you know this podcast comes to you from Wesley Biblical Seminary, where we are developing trusted leaders for faithful churches. We do that with through bachelor's, master's, doctoral degrees. We have a lay initiative called the Wesley Institute. On top of that, uh, I'm happy to announce like we're in a place where we have our highest enrollment in our history with close to 400 Global Methodist Church pastors, 750 people in academic programs. So it's a real delight for us to be serving the church at this time. And I would love for people to even check out a recent article by my friend Clay, who is a um, new friend of mine. And it's in Christianity Today featuring various Wesley institutions and, and, and leaders who are sharing ideas about sharing their thoughts with Clay about God's work through various groups in the Wesleyan movement at this time. It's a really exciting moment, I believe, in Wesleyan history. So today, what I wanted to do is I wanted to share with you an article that was published in Firebrand just yesterday. And then if I have time, add a few comments to it as we go along and or maybe after it's done. And I also want to encourage people, if you if you haven't done so already, to sign up for my email list at andymillerthethird.com. That's Andy Miller I I I dot com. And when you do that, I'll send you a free tool called five steps to deeper teaching and preaching. And that's something that's a 45 minute video teaching, something I go over with helping people learn a kind of a, a shorter version of the inductive Bible study method with the aim of helping them think creatively about how that is presented. All right. So I'm going to read this article. And I'll do my best to read it in a way that's not overly dramatic, which is uh, maybe something I have a problem doing every now and then. But it is titled um, Bishops, Generals, and the Ev and Evangelical Totalitarianism. I know that's a bit of a dramatic title, but I am trying to catch some folks' attention here. And this comes in light of what's happening at the Global Methodist Church and in light of some of the research I've done on 19th century Wesleyan movements. Here it is. After spending 42 years in the Salvation Army and being a sixth-generation Salvation Army officer, clergy, God called me to transfer my credentials to the Global Methodist Church, where I am now an elder and will be a clergy delegate to its convening general conference. I was attracted to the GMC in part because it articulates and upholds a classical Wesleyan theological foundation, and it emphasizes the local church while maintaining connectionalism. The conversation surrounding the GMC Episcopacy piqued my interest. My last Army appointment was in the Florida Division, which had 38 Salvation Army churches, corps. Those churches have a state headquarters in Tampa with more than 140 full-time employees, 10 who are Salvation Army officers or clergy. By contrast, the GMC Annual Conference, Mississippi, where my GMC Annual Conference, Mississippi, Western Tennessee, has 202 churches and one full-time employee. The Salvation Army is a denomination that discipled me, and I love and appreciate it. Most Salvationists desire to see the Army's spiritual foundation and ecclesial witness renewed. Yet, there are historical and structural challenges with its leadership model that I believe have made it less effective as a denomination and more of an organization maintaining its existence. While some like Billy Abraham, identified John Wesley as a benevolent dictator, they might be surprised to learn William Booth, the Army's founder, believed the weakness of Wesley's movement was that his leadership wasn't strong enough. Booth went as far as to call John Wesley's polity a failure. For Booth, Wesley didn't utilize enough power. He didn't demand sufficient obedience, and his mission was not fully realized. Booth saw his army as the embodiment of Methodism's true potential. Booth's Methodist history. Booth came to Christ at a Wesleyan Methodist chapel in Nottingham, England, and responded to God's call to preach in that tradition. He matriculated during what John Kent called the age of disunity within Methodism. 
Differences regarding ecclesial polity and doctrinal emphases led to the founding of several denominations who all considered themselves heirs of Wesley, who served in two Methodist denominations before he was ordained in the Methodist New Connection. He left that denomination in 1861 because he resisted the directives of its hierarchy. After spending four years as an itinerant revivalist, he came to London's East End and found, quote, his destiny, end quote, preaching to the masses. Except for his decision to jettison the sacraments in 1883, Booth never moved away from Wesleyan theology. One of his commonly repeated stump speeches alluded to his love for Wesley, where he explained, I worshipped everything that bore the name Methodist. To me, there was one God, and John Wesley was his prophet. I had devoured the, in the story of his life. No human compositions seemed to me to be comparable to his writings and to the hymns of his brother Charles. And all that was wanted in, the, in my estimation for the salvation of the world was the faithful carrying into practice of the letter and the spirit of his instructions. Even with this admiration for Methodism and Wesley, Booth's evangelistic agency shifted away from Mr. Wesley's model. Booth's evolution toward total control. The earliest expressions of the army mirrored the theology Booth learned in Methodism. Nevertheless, Booth began to part with Wesley in one key area, polity. From 1865 through 1878, Booth's movement functioned with a Methodist-like polity. Power flowed from the conference and in turn was given to its general superintendent, William Booth. Throughout the 1870s, decision-making authority was increasingly given to Booth, so much so that in 1878, when the name changed from the Christian mission to the Salvation Army, he was given total control of all personnel, property, finances, and veto power over every decision of the conference. As a result, Booth was often accused of taking papal authority, a charge he welcomed. In fact, Booth's power was stronger than the Pope's because he was granted the authority to name his own successor. This happened by a secret envelope to be opened by his lawyers at his death. He also saw his system as the closest to that of the Bible and the primitive church. When he appealed for more power in 1877, he lamented how evangelistic ground had been lost because of his Methodist-like conference committees. He appealed to the conference to give him control. Quote, this proposal to abolish conference authority is a question of confidence as between you and me. And if you can't trust me, it is no use for us to attempt to work together. Confidence in God and in me are absolutely indispensable, both now and ever afterward. In 1878, with the name change, Booth adopted what he called an absolute military system that relied on the obedience of salvationists to Booth and the surrogates to whom he delegated authority. He modified existing ecclesiastical norms by using military terms to describe his ministry workers. In this system, modeled loosely on the British Army and Navy, his pastors, ministers, and evangelists became field officers, staff officers, and commanding officers with ranks like captain, lieutenant, major, and colonel. Booth, the general superintendent, became simply the general. Booth's objection to Methodist polity. In, 1878, in the 1878 Orders and Regulations, Booth differentiated his army by saying that there was a uselessness in the Methodistic system and ordinary systems of church government because of their democratic functions. Instead, his system gave, quote, absolute authority to every author, officer within the range of his command from top to bottom, end quote. Later in that same document, he suggested the army had, quote, tried and rejected that system, even though the effects of the Methodist system are not, alas, entirely gone from us yet. There are still some here and there who like to have business meetings and determine by vote what shall and shall not be done, end quote. He gladly declared that he was like an emperor and spoke positively about imitating Napoleon and Caesar. He argued that Quote, under anything like a system of self-government, they, his officers, would soon turn the Salvation Army into a carpet regiment, end quote. To him, this kind of ecclesiological absolutism maintained the Army's evangelistic edge. 
He suggested that democratic functions were the weakness of Methodism. That's, quote, that's what has ruined Methodism. That's what threatens to ruin Christianity. That's what shall never touch us as long as I live or my son, end quote. In the late 1870s through the mid-1880s, the army experienced exponential growth. Booth didn't attribute such growth to his pragmatic theology, brass bands, revivalistic methods, or military uniforms. The army hadn't become its social wing, its social wing at the time, so social action wasn't the reason, according to Booth, for its growth. For Booth, the army's success was based in his polity, his absolute military system, his total control over this new denomination and the, quote, uniform obedience, end quote, of his officers and soldiers was the reason for its success. Speaking to the Wesley Methodist Conference in 1880, he linked himself to Wesley and said, quote, this movement is the continuation of the work of Mr. Wesley. For we have gone on only a great deal further on the same lines in which he traveled, end quote. To Booth, he took the Aubrey on further than Wesley because of his military approach to polity. On another occasion, he suggested that Wesley's polity and lack of control was a, quote, failure, end quote. Furthering his critique of the Methodist system, Booth asserted in his Methodist Times interview with Hugh Price Hughes, quote, every soldier in the, ar in the army is willing to obey and wait for orders. The great weakness of Methodism is that you are not governed. You meet in conference and pass the most beautiful resolutions, and they are not carried out. Your president has no authority, end quote. Ironically, Booth was unwilling to submit to the governance of the conference when he served with the Methodist New Connection, yet his army was structured to go on, as he says, go on, quote, further, end quote, than Wesley, and was careful to, quote, avoid his mistakes, end quote. Evangelical totalitarianism. In the past, I assumed that references to Booth and Wesley as totalitarians were mainly or were, were mere scholarly hyperbole. However, in my research on Booth, the word total kept surfacing to describe how he ecclesiologically ordered the army's existence. All assets, personnel, doctrine, and methods were, and technically are, under the authority of the general. Salvationist outfits, marriage ceremonies, hymnals, reading materials, and bedroom layouts were directed by Booth with a militarized accent. Political science David Roberts suggests that totalitarianism involves, quote, total mobilization and direction of energies towards some great end, end quote. Such systems reduce individual freedom, not, quote, simply to maximize control, but to mobilize the population, end quote. For Booth, the totality of his army's energies were directed to saving people from eternal damnation. His totalizing control was modified by his evangelistic foundation of saving the whosoever. Hence, it was an evangelical totalitarianism. Booth's intellectually astute wife, Catherine, provided exegetical justification for adopting an absolute military system. She recognized that the Bible doesn't contain explicit guidelines for church governance. Quote, we cannot get the order of a single service for, from the New Testament, nor can we get the form of government for a single church, end quote. When sinking a map for polity, she said, quote, it is not there. Do you think God has no purpose in this omission? End quote. To their credit, this system came about because of their conviction that people were headed to hell. Thus, all ecclesial forms could be bypassed for saving souls. For Catherine and William, the total mobilization of resources and the accumulation of power was justified because of the evangelistic need. Sadly, Booth's absolute military system was a foundation for his estranged relationships with three of his eight children and their spouses. They, along with many others, Christian leaders like J.B. Lightfoot, Henry Manning, B.F. Westcott, and the seventh Earl of Shaftesbury, Anthony Ashley Cooper, who criticized the army, suggested the army's polity was its chief defect. In 1929, the Salvation Army changed one aspect of its polity when it deposed Booth's designated successor, his son, Bramwell Booth. Its constitution 
had a provision for implementing a high council where a group of commissioners, i.e. bishops, elect each succeeding general, which since that time has been operative. Still, there have only been minor governance changes to Booth's absolute military system. When a leader has control of both temporal and spiritual aspects of an organization, the urgency of the temporal needs drives a leader to prioritize survival and maintenance over missional priorities. When the burden of leadership is shared and separated, shepherding leaders are free to focus on the mission to create a greater to our sorry, excuse me, are free to focus on the mission to a greater degree. While the army in the West has grown as an organization, it has struggled to maintain an ecclesial identity. As one of America's favorite charities, it has expanded in the USA to holding more than $12 billion in net assets. Though not intentional, the ecclesial and evangelistic mission is easily and often neglected. I suggest that the Army's polity has been the primary reason it has moved toward maintaining itself as an organization rather than growing as an ecclesial movement. Nevertheless, this leadership structure has positioned the Army to be a leading force in, quote, doing the most good, end quote. This system makes it quick to, quote, meet human needs in Jesus' name without discrimination, end quote. As the GMC anticipates its convening general conference, I hope it can learn from the example of the army, its ecclesial cousin. I do not believe the GMC is in danger of becoming merely a charitable organization, but its mission could be hindered if too much authority is given to one office. Separated powers can prevent one leader from grasping more power than is healthy. Local churches need order, discipline, and connectionalism. Yet organizations that move toward maintaining themselves and handing too much power to one leader can embrace an evangelical totalitarianism. It may not happen in one generation, but this structure is problematic in the long run. As such, United Methodism's abuse of the Episcopacy and the Salvation Army's absolute military system should serve as a warning to avoid accumulating such power. Well, thanks for taking a chance uh, to listen to that. When I use the word absolute, I am being dramatic. It is a part of the scholarly literature to identify both Wesley and Booth with that language. I tried to modify it, um, but I do want to say it in a somewhat dramatic way. But the emphasis on totalizing, that there's a totalizing control for leaders in that tradition. And so I'm cautious, and some, some might know that in the conference for which I'm a delegate, we have um, unanimously supported the TLC's plan for bishops, um, kind of the the general superintendency model, sometimes called the traveling bishops model. I think that separates powers out in such a way that can move folks away from maintenance. Um, I know arguments are made on the other side as well, and this certainly isn't meant by me to be a cheap shot at the army. I think it's a, I think it's a deep historical shot and and trying to call out what's there. And I do have hope that leaders in the Salvation Army might be ones um, who, since they have this power, could leverage it to be able to bring more emphasis to how the Salvation Army exists as a congregation. That I, I think I think there's a beautiful theology that's at the heart of the Salvation Army, and that theology is shared by the Global Methodist Church as well. So it's my hope that that can be the case. Um, but I'm, of course, glad to talk to anybody. And I had a couple of friends reach out to me who had some concerns and, and just had some questions about my article from within the Salvation Army. And, of course, I'm glad to talk to anybody about that. And more of that research uh, will be coming out in the future as I'm like looking at the context of 19th century Methodism and the emergence of the Salvation Army as a church that didn't that claimed to not be a church, which is a paradox. So that's why I say it is more or less a church. Sometimes it seems more than a church. Sometimes it seems less than a church. Um, and depending on who's saying it, that could come from the inside or the outside of the Salvation Army. Uh, both things are expressed. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing folks in Costa Rica. Thank you for taking time to check out this podcast. Kind of our our regularly scheduled podcast will be coming next week. Um, But just kind of like some of the basic interviews I do with people on some of their work. I have a a book. um, There's a a new, I have a, see his name here. Uh, 
Ben Shaw, uh, in his book, Trustworthy. I had a great interview with him. Talk about the trustworthiness of the New Testament. That will be coming out next week. Thank you all for checking this out. God bless you.